Welcome to Echoes International Podcast, with teaching, interviews and stories of what God is doing straight from the mission field and also within the UK. For more podcasts, stories and opportunities to get involved, check out our website at echoesinternational.org.uk and our other social media channels. Thanks again for your invitation to be here uh, this weekend. Um, If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. That's where we're going to be camping out this afternoon. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. So Matthew 4, and we're going to start from verse 12. And there we, there we read, now when he, that's Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in the darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets, and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And we trust God, a lot of blessing to the reading of his word. The verses I want to, to focus in on uh, this afternoon with the time that we've got. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. I wonder what word jumps out at you from that, those verses. The ones that stand out as being quite shocking. For me, the one that I can't get my head around is the one immediately. They were called and immediately they left everything behind and they followed after Jesus. For me, when it came to my calling into full-time ministry, my response was not immediate. It was pretty far from immediate. Why I felt God calling me into into full-time youth ministry in January 2011. And I was at a youth conference up in, up in Aviemore, not that far away uh, from here. I was surrounded by 300 Christian youth workers, and I was listening to a man preach. A guy's called Pete Gregg, who does 24-7 prayer ministries. And he was speaking at this conference, and he was speaking on John chapter 21, and the breakfast by the sea with Jesus and Peter, and this call from Jesus to Peter to feed his sheep. And Pete said quite clearly, I really believe there's someone here, and God is saying to you, I want you to go and I want you to feed my sheep. Now to me that was a really odd call because I was surrounded by 300 Christian youth workers and surely all of us were supposed to be uh, feeding his sheep. That's what we were called to do. But there was something within me that I thought I really need to listen here and I need to take this seriously. I was working as a Christian youth worker with, for YMCA, but I didn't feel like I was doing exactly what God had called me to do. I didn't feel like I was using all of the gifts that God had given me to use, and I felt like God was calling me to something more. So I left Aviemore and I drove home and I was chatting a little bit to my friend um, as we drove home and started to share a little bit about this burden that had been placed on my heart. And when I got home, I did the toughest thing that that married guys you'll, you'll ever have to do. I said to my wife, I think I might be getting called to leave my job. 
Now, if you ever want to see the blood leave your wife's face in the quickest time possible, say those words, because Cheryl just went white. I said, are you sure? I said, no, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. And so that was January 2011, and from that point we decided to just be deliberate in our conversations about this and to be speaking together as a couple about what this would mean and what God might be calling us to do. And so as we went into our Bibles and we read the Bible together and we prayed together, we wrestled over this call for quite a few, quite a few weeks, maybe six to eight weeks before we decided, do you know what, we need to let someone else into this conversation so I went to the elders in my church and I said, look, I feel like this might be a direction that God is calling me. I don't want to make a decision about it right now, but I want to bring you into this conversation. And then as time went on, I started to speak to a few other people uh, that I trusted, uh, other people that were in full-time ministry. And I said, this is something that God is calling me to do. I just want to chat to you about it. And I found people that I trusted and I brought them into the situation and I listened to what they had to say and they, they, they listened to me. And this went on for a period of eight months. It took me till August before I decided that I was actually going to have to make a decision about this. And I went to another conference. This one was in Glasgow and it was a conference called The Commission. It was a, a men's event that was happening uh, in the Glasgow concert hall. Um, and I decided that if I got a word from God, if it became really clear to me that this is what I was supposed to do at this conference, then I would hand my notice in on the Monday. And so I sat through that conference called the Commission. Now for a conference called the Commissioning, there was very little commissioning done at the conference. I never got one word as I sat throughout the whole day. I was listening to a guy, Jeff Lucas, preaching, and he never said one thing that made me think that I should leave my work and go into full-time ministry. In fact, at one point, he stopped, what he, was, he stopped where he was in his tracks, and he screamed at the, odd, at the crowd, and he said, one of you is on the brink of disaster. I'm like, well, brilliant. That's, 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 that's the word for me. Okay, I'm definitely going down the wrong path here. So I started to feel quite comfortable. I started to feel, great, that's, that's it. This isn't for me. I can just keep on going. Life as normal. Brilliant. This is exactly what, um, what I was hoping for. But then at the end of the conference, as the worship leader was up, and it was Stuart Townend that was doing the worship, and it was the last hymn, and he was praying at the last hymn, and he said, God, there's someone here who's, who's searching uh, for an answer from you, and I believe that the answer is yes. I thought, oh, man. And for me, that was it. I knew at that point this was what I was going to have to do. The answer was yes, and the answer was go. And I went out in Glasgow. I had dinner with, with Cheryl, my wife, and my uh, sister, and my brother-in-law, and started to speak to them about it. And then we went back to the concert hall for, for um, a, a, a Stuart Townend concert that, that, that evening. And as there was a little break in that concert, as Jeff Lucas came back out and did an epilogue, what did he speak on? John 21. Jesus and Peter, feed my sheep. And for eight months, that was my calling experience. And it felt like such tor tor turmoil in those eight months as I searched and I wrestled with God. And it felt like at times I was just completely on my own. I didn't know what God was doing. But now when I zoom out and I look at those eight months, you know what it feels like God was doing? Was just tying a ribbon and tying a bow in my calling. That It would start with John 21 and it would end in John 21. And if you think about tying the bow, you know, there's the, there's the tension and there's the knots and it looks like a mess. And then suddenly there's just a flourish and you see exactly what God is doing. That was me. Eight months it took for me to figure out my calling and to make the decision to go and to make that, diff that change. So when I read about Peter and I read about Andrew and I read about James and John and then seeing Jesus and Jesus saying, leave everything and come and follow me. And immediately they do it. Immediately. What faith they must have. What they must have seen in Jesus to leave everything behind and to go and to, to make that change in their life. And that's why these verses are so important uh, to me.
And we read so much about Jesus' ministry in these verses. You know, we started in verse 12 where we read about Jesus moving his headquarters, his his base of operations from Nazareth to Capernaum. And, you know, Matthew's the only gospel writer who really tells us about this this move that Jesus makes. You would think that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, you would think that he would pick maybe a more appropriate headquarters for his ministry than Capernaum. You don't think the Son of God would set up shop in a place like Capernaum. To give you a modern day context for Capernaum, it's a bit like the Ibiza of today. It's where people went for debauchery. It's where people went uh, to get drunk. It's where people went to escape. It was this holiday destination where terrible, terrible things would happen. And yet that's where Jesus decided that he would go and set up his base. He went to Capernaum. um, And and he went there. uh, He went there because that's where the need was. He went there because that's where he he, he was called to go. Luke chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus says, uh, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. When Jesus went to Capernaum, he looked around and all he saw were sinners. All he saw were the people who were living these evil uh, lives. And he went so that he could shine brightly uh, there. There's another reason that he went. He went to fulfill prophecy. Isaiah wrote um, that this is where Jesus would go. Um, Isaiah expected that the most northern part of Israel, which was the first part that would experience God's judgment when it came to a Syrian invasion and when it came to exile, it was always the northern part of the country that was captured first. Those, that part of the country that was always the first to experience God's uh, judgment in that regard, they were going to be the first ones who were going to experience God's redemption through the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah paints this picture that's similar to the picture that we painted uh, last night um, of shining in the darkness. Uh, Isaiah paints the picture of the light shining of the darkness and over the shadow of death. And you know, there's no, no darker thought. There's no more terrible thought that you can think of than an enemy invasion coming into your land, an enemy coming away and stripping away your freedom. And that's exactly what these people had experienced under the hand of the Assyrians. They rejected God and the enemy took over. And this is exactly the same for man today. This is the same for the people that we are going to go and call and be shined brightly for uh, and, uh, and, and, and share Jesus with. They are people who have rejected God so that they can have what they feel is their own freedoms to come in and take over the things that they feel is better. Man thinks that a rejection of God is a step towards freedom and liberty, but it's not. When we turn from God, we turn from light and we embrace darkness. We think we become masters of our own fate. We think we become masters of our own destiny. But all we do is invite the enemy to invade. And we replace the one true God with lots of sinful idols like we thought about last night. The good news for us is that just like those people in Zebulun and Naphtali, is that God has loved us despite our rebellion. God has loved us despite the fact that we have turned our back on him. And God has sent a light to shine in the darkness so that we might see Jesus in all his goodness and all his glory. And he calls us as his children to do the same for others so that we would be a light that would shine brightly in the darkness so that people would see him in all of his goodness and all of his glory. Jesus' message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the same message that we have for our brothers and our sisters and our colleagues and our friends that we have to repent, we have to turn around, we have to change the way that we're living because there's something better to live for and that something and someone is Jesus Christ. And we need to turn out of our rebellion, break the chains of the captors because the king is here We need to embrace him and experience, and and, and by doing that, experience true freedom and true liberty. So this was Jesus' message. He came to shine brightly. He came to be a light in the darkness. And he invited other people into that ministry. He invited people to walk alongside him. He invited people to learn with him. He invited people to be his disciples. And Jesus starts by approaching fishermen. 
Not scholars, not teachers, not lawyers, not priests. He starts by approaching fishermen. Does that not throw your heart that God could use people from such humble backgrounds? For me, it's a great joy to know that God can use people from humble backgrounds because I am from a humble background. But sometimes I think we overplay the view that Jesus chose fishermen. It's not that he just chose people from humble backgrounds. Jesus also chose educated men. Jesus also chose men of authority. He also chose uh, men and women of wealth. He also chose um, people who were educated. It's hard to paint Paul with the uneducated underdog brush. He says himself that he has every reason to boast. He's raised in Tarsus, the university hub of its day. He's educated by Gamaliel, the foremost teacher of his day. He's respected by religious leaders. He's comfortable amongst royalty. It's true to say that God can use anyone to advance his kingdom. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter what your experience is. It matters that you love Jesus and you want to share him with others and you're willing to pay the price to do that. That's what, it, that's what matters if we're going to be called to a life of mission, that we are willing to count the cost to bring Jesus to others. God can use anyone for his kingdom expansion to bring glory to his name. How amazing that Jesus uses these four men to start his ministry alongside. How more amazing, though, that Jesus chooses anyone at all. Firstly, teachers don't pick their students. Students pick their teachers. That's the way that it tends to work, isn't it? And we can appreciate that somewhat in the 21st century, that no teacher has ever come to you and said, I want to teach you. It's always the, uh, the, the other way around. A student would seek out a teacher, not the other way. But Jesus is modeling something that would be the basis for our, our redemption. That it's not about us coming to God, but it's about God coming to us. It's not about us choosing God, but it's about God choosing us. It's not about us getting to a level where we can be accepted, getting our education to a standard where we can justify having that teacher, which is the way the world sometimes works today. But it's about that teacher choosing us. It's about God choosing, choosing us. And Jesus seeks out these men just as he sought us out. He invests in these men just as he's a plan to invest in you and to teach you and to sanctify you and to make you more like him. Just as he loves and cares for us, he loved and cared for these men. And just as he had a mission for those, these men, he has a mission for us as well. Jesus pursues us. Jesus enters into our lives. Jesus comes into our place of work. Jesus comes into our homes and says, follow after me. He reminds us of this in John chapter 15, where he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you you, that you should go and you should bear fruit. I wonder if we really appreciate this, that God has chosen us. He has appointed us. He has given us uh, this mandate that we should go and we should bear fruit. We do it because we are called, each and every one of us, just like Peter and Andrew and James and John, we have been called to go and make fishers of men. You know, when I was uh, in Arbroath, which is the, the, the church that I grew up in, um, every f January, February, similar to this actually, we would have a, a missions weekend where we had, we'd have excuse me, minister, min missionaries from all over the world coming uh, and sharing um, their stories of world mission. And for me, it was the best part of my church year. I just loved to sit and to listen to the stories of people that were being reached in South America and Africa and, and all, across, uh, all across the world. Uh, and we didn't get any of these fancy HD videos either. You know, we had to switch the lights off and have the slide projectors up and, you know, 
it says something when the most exciting thing that a seven-year-old saw in the church was when the slide projector was wheeled out. You know, we didn't have the fancy laser pointers either. We had the big, long wooden sticks that you would also use to open the windows, uh, and that would be used to point to the people that were on the screen. And I remember one missionary coming, a man called Sam Hanlon, who um, was a missionary in Honduras. And I last sat for one weekend and just, let, just was captivated by his every word and the stories that he would bring from Honduras. And I remember him preaching on Matthew chapter 4. And I was seven years old, and I can still remember that he preached on Matthew chapter 4 and talked about these verses, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And the way that he uh, embedded it into, into my mind was that we sat and we sang the chorus, you know, the children's chorus, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. One of the most repetitive children's choruses that there ever is, because those are the words, and you sing it a hundred times. Uh, and you, you, would, you would try and make this, the chorus a little bit more interesting by the female standing up for the fishers and the male standing up uh, for the men, uh, just, so, just, just so you could get through it. Um, but you came to the, t- the 99th time of singing the lines. Uh, but Sam taught us how to sing it uh, in whatever language it is that he, was, uh, he, that, that he taught um, taught us from, from Honduras, and I can still remember it now, Pescadore, USRA, Semi Segi Re, you know, this, these lines that are so simple and so easy to understand, but the challenge of these lines is immense. The challenge that is here is such a simple statement, but actually if we're to apply it to our life, it is so far from simple. In fact, it's probably the most challenging command given to mankind in all of Scripture, that we are to go and we are to be fishers of men. It's the mission given to us by God in a nutshell, clearly stating what God wants and expects us to do as his people, namely to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature and to give your all to him. C.H. Spurgeon said, your business, your business is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And God's business is to draw his own to himself. This is what we are called to do, to go and to preach the word. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are to go and to be fishers of men, just like these, these four disciples. I don't know if you've ever fished before. I'm not a particularly good fisherman. My son loves to fish, and I don't understand it um, at all. Uh, one of the things I do quite like to do, though, is early in the morning, if I, <coughs> I'm up early with the kids, you tend to flick on the, uh, one of these documentary channels, and you'll see uh, Robson Green standing at his front door in one of these fishing documentaries. And he'll have on the screen, this is the fish that we are going after today. And it'll be this ugly monstrosity uh, up on the screen. He says, this is what we're going for. And he closes his door and he gets in the taxi and he goes off to the airport. And he jumps, uh, he gets into the plane and he flies halfway across the world. uh, And then he flies through another airport from there. And then he gets into a car and he drives off into the jungle. And he jumps out of the car and then he's on a canoe and he's paddling up the canoe. And and then he gets off off the canoe and he finds someone with with a bike and he jumps on the bike and he goes over a mountain to the other side of the mountain and then finally he gets to the water where this ugly fish is and you think wow that's determination isn't it that you're willing to go that far for for this fish that just shows such determination that that is the length that you are willing to go to to pursue your catch and, you know, I look at that and I think, wow, well, what lengths am I willing to go to to pursue my catch? A step before that would be, what is my catch? Who is it that I'm actually called to go and to fish for? If I'm going to go and fish for someone, if I'm going to go and try and share the gospel, and I'm going to make that person my fish, that's the person that God has placed on my heart to bring to him Who is that? And who is that for you? 
You know, we were thinking in our session yesterday about not everyone being called to be an evangelist in the sense of going and preaching to hundreds and thousands of people or not being called to go into a different environment where we don't know anyone and share the gospel in that context. We are all called to have a fish and we are all called to share the gospel and to make disciples of the people in our own community and our own context. God has placed someone on your heart. I truly believe it, each and every one of you. One, two, three people. He's given you a burden for them. He's given you a burden for them to go and to share the gospel with them and to make Jesus real to them. Who is it? If you're struggling to find out, think of the most difficult person that you know who you don't want to share the gospel with. That's them. For me, it's my sister. It's my sister. Grew up with her. She was saved the same year. Well, she made a profession the same year that I made a profession. She was baptized the same night I was baptized. She joined the church the same day that I joined the church, but she's not saved. She's completely lost. And it's the person that I find the most difficult to speak to about Jesus. The person I know the best. I find it so difficult to open up around the gospel with her. Who is it for you? Who is your fish? We need to have, we need to know who our fish is if we're going to go and we're going to share the gospel with the people that God really has placed in our heart and given us our burden for. We need to be deliberate in our fishing. We need to have a strategy. You know, we can't just open up our church doors on the Sundays and expect people to walk in. We can't just open up our church doors on a Sunday and expect people to walk in and be saved by the gospel. It can happen. And the Holy Spirit can do that and and use our efforts in that way. But it's not the way that we have been designed. It's not the way that we've been told to go and to do discipleship. Sometimes I, I, I feel like this, this, this model of just opening up the doors and, and hoping people come in, it's a little bit like sitting, watching a man in an Asda car park with a fishing rod expecting to catch something. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. It's crazy. We've been told to go into all the world. Our ministry is called Go Youth Trust because that is what we know we're supposed to do, to go out to go out from the established church, to go out from everything that's established and to go into the places that are unreached, to go to the people that do not know Jesus and to share him with them. Fishing has a strategy. We should have a strategy as well. In Jesus' day, fish would be caught one of three ways. There would be line fishing, there would be dragnet fishing, there would be cast net fishing. And the most amazing thing about the way that disciples caught fish throughout the Gospels By the way, quick question. Does anyone know how many fish the disciples caught without Jesus' help in the Gospels? Zero. These amazing fishermen didn't catch any fish without Jesus' help. And the most amazing thing about the times that they did catch these multitude of fish is that they caught them in all the wrong way. So they would come in after a night of fishing with all of their, their tools and their nets designed for night fishing. And in the morning, Jesus would say, throw the nets in to the sea. Well, it's not going to work because it's the wrong net. And then they catch 153 fish. It's amazing what you can do when Jesus is with you. He defies all odds. And it's the same uh, with with our ministry. If we go with Jesus and we can see amazing things happen. But it's important that we have a strategy that we know we recognize who our fish is and we go out and we go after them. It's so important. And so I leave you with that question. Who is your fish? Because you know there's two people fishing in the world. We're fishing for men, but Satan is fishing as well. Satan is looking to put people on the hook. Satan is, look, Satan is looking to ensnare people into the, into the darkness. It's what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. They come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. There's two people going after your fish. It's not just you. Satan's there as well. But we have Jesus. And he has the victory. He's won it on the cross. We have the hope. We, have, we are 
born in to this living hope. We don't do this on our own. And so who's our fish? And what are we willing to do to go and to share Jesus with them? Are we actually willing to go and reach the unreached? Or is it just something that's nice to talk about for a, couple, for, for a few days up at Fascally? Or are we willing to make this real? Who are the unreached in your life? And are you willing to go after them? Who are the unreached in the world? And has God called you to go and to serve them? Are you listening to his voice? And if you hear him say, come and follow me and do this, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do it immediately? Are you willing to take eight months to pray over it and think about it? Or are you not? Are you just going to say no and close up to it? God has given us this mandate. He has given us this mission. He has called us to be fishers of men. He has called us to be, fe- to be children of the light. He has called us not to be rooted in this world, but to be strangers and to be exiles and to be different from the people around about us. Are we willing to be all of those things? We hope you're encouraged and inspired and ready to answer the call. Thank you for listening. 